Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. It's Julie McCrossan here welcoming you to the Walper Wellbeing Program this evening. Our topic tonight is the path back to a new normal. And we're talking about managing depression, anxiety, and suicide risk. I just want to let you know as audience members, uh, first of all, thank you so much for joining us. But you are uh, on mute and your video is off. But you can right from now start asking questions of the panel who will be joining us shortly on the Q&A function, not the chat, the Q&A function. Tell you more about it in a moment, but it's my pleasure now to invite to kick off proceedings the president of Walper Jewish Hospital, Richard Glass. Please make him welcome in this traditional manner. Good evening. Thank you, Julie, and thank you everyone for joining us uh, for our wellbeing seminar this evening. To say we are living in challenging times would be an absolute understatement. There is no one who has not been affected in some way by this pandemic, and all our lives have been changed for the foreseeable future. It's expected that the psychological effects of COVID-19 will touch many more people than, and will endure well beyond its physical and medical impact. For many people, this once in a century event is extremely disturbing and can precipitate feelings and behaviours previously alien to them and their families. We want people to know that it's okay to ask for help. We want people to know from where they can get that help. And we want them to know that they are not alone. For that reason, our Walper Wellbeing team has curated a series of seminars to help our community better understand the emotional and psychological issues that may impact both those we love or those such as our employees, or perhaps if we're a carer, our employers, for whom we are in some way responsible. In doing so, we've chosen to partner with some of our leading primary care providers to help raise awareness of the extensive range of support services available in our community. And I'm delighted to say that this evening, we are partnering with Jewish Care, which is an outstanding organisation. So, I trust you'll find this evening's discussion informative, and at this point, I'd like to introduce our wellbeing convener and life member, Dr. Alan Schell. Uh, thanks, Richard, and uh, thank you, Julie. Uh, for those of you who may not know, Walpa Jewish Hospital is a, a private first in its class hospital in our community, specialising in orthopaedics, in post operative rehab, rehab for older people, palliative care, our Move Well program, and of course, we have hydrotherapy classes as well as private in-house and in-home physio. And we're part of the Jewish community organisations and we cater for all people of all faiths and cultures. Our approach to health has always been very holistic and being part of this wellbeing program for over 15 years, we've covered a, range, a huge range of health related uh, topics. And as Richard mentioned, mental health wellbeing is so important at this difficult time for all of us in Australia and the rest of the world and a challenging one. And we know tonight we have more than 150 people who are registered and at least 30% of those will have more than themselves on online. So we welcome over 200 people. So obviously it's a very important topic for all of us. And we appreciate that all of you are here with us this evening. Um, I guess that says a lot in itself. And remember, we do have questions on the Q&A uh, opportunity. Uh, they're anonymous and we'll try to get through all of them as best we can, but sometimes we'll have to leave it for next time. Tonight we're partnering with Jewish Care as they provide a wide range of services and expertise uh, to help support people through these very challenging times. Um, and tonight we have uh, CEO of Jewish Care, Claire Vernon, uh, to give us a brief overview of what they can do for you. Thank you and over to you, Claire. Hi, thanks very much everybody and uh, welcome to this uh, forum. Um, times of great uncertainty can create roller coasters of emotions. We're all going through it. Uh, fear, will we survive? Anxiety, am I safe? Dread, what is happening in the world? Relief now, are we going to get through this? And joy, finding joy in the day that we're surviving. Jewish Care has been around since 1936, responding to new and emerging issues as they arise. And the pandemic is one more of those issues that we need to respond to, and we're well placed to do so. 
Emotional and psychological well-being, as Alan said, is always been part of a package of care by providers. Our mental health and well-being team in particular continue to grow and expand to support people living with mental illness. Our Jewish suicide prevention strategy, which has been supported by Wolpa Foundation, is now going into its third year. And we've trained hundreds of community members in mental health first aid and suicide prevention. The Jewish community launched a Jewish emergency relief fund at the height of the pandemic. Jewish Care has administered that fund on behalf of the Jewish community organization. And we've distributed over $400,000 to families in need which has helped relieve a lot of stress and anxiety as we go into a period of unemployment. Our partnership with Headspace, our youth Jewish interagency means we're connecting with the young people who we worry about in the community and the impacts. There has been so much innovation during this time, using technology to mentor young people, support isolated seniors, and we're now providing mental health first aid training online. So as you hear from your panel tonight, please be assured that Jewish Care is here for you and with our caring and professional staff can help respond to the concerns and anxieties we're all living through. Thanks and over to Julie. Uh, thank you, Claire. Uh, thank you very much. And I should say that we will be meeting uh, two members of Claire's team uh, a little bit later in our discussions this evening to talk uh, a little bit about the work that they're specifically doing. Well, welcome if you've just joined us. This is uh, the path back to the new normal, managing depression, anxiety and suicide. We've got three uh, panellists I'm about to introduce you to, but I just want to alert Jackson, who is our man up in the stratosphere, uh, controlling events tonight, that I'm going to go to one of our polls shortly. But just before I go to the poll, I want to let you know that Dr. Alan Schell is our question moderator tonight, a, a, a long-term uh, supporter of WALPA, but also a working general practitioner. And he'll be taking questions via the Q&A button that you can see on the bottom of your screen. We won't be using the chat button, but you can press on Q&A and Alan will be monitoring those questions. And my brief tonight is to make sure we get through as many questions as possible. Um, I also uh, want to let you know that while we, you won't be able to be seen and heard, Dr. Allen will be your advocate tonight uh, by answering, by asking your questions. And as he mentioned earlier, he will be asking them anonymously so you can be uh, completely unguarded. Um, fundamentally tonight, we want to offer you tools to handle all the changes that are happening and to manage the return to what they're calling the new normal or the COVID-19 workplace. Uh, uh, and uh, we'll get a sense from our panel members what that might mean. So I'd like to go to our first poll. I'm just going to hopefully see it come up. It's been nominated, yes it is, by one of our speakers. How would you describe the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic on your emotional well-being? If it's uh, negative, you'll see you're down near the ones. If you feel there's been positives, you're up near uh, the eights. So I'll just let our audience vote and I'll just be quiet for a few moments while you click on the numbers there to indicate how you would describe on a scale from one to 10, the impact of COVID-19, the pandemic on your emotional well-being. And I'm just letting the panelists know you can't vote. This is an audience vote. Well, I might ask Jackson to use his judgment if he feels that a good proportion of our audience, well over half have voted, we might ask him to pop the results up on the screen as he sees fit. And there I can, uh, can see all the results and I'm assuming that you can all see the results. Uh, I will just note that the largest number is 24% 24, 24 
of people who voted so far are rating themselves as in the negative area. So I won't do all the maths myself. I'll just let you observe. And what I might do now, Jackson, is introduce our panel. And I might ask you later to put up the final vote when we've had the full number of people voting, because I noticed that we've uh, got more people watching than we have voting. So if you could take that off the screen at this moment, and I will now introduce our panel members. And how excited I am to introduce Dr. Uh, uh, John Brogdon, AM, the chair of Lifeline, of course, former leader of the opposition in New South Wales, a businessman, and a, a very strong advocate uh, for suicide prevention. Also with us tonight, Professor Ian Hickey, AM, uh, Professor of Psychiatry at the University of Sydney, the co-director of the Brain and Mind Centre. He focuses on health and policy and the NH and MRC Senior Principal Research Fellow there, so a, a leading researcher. And our third panellist tonight, Dr Philippa Levy, a child and adolescent psychiatrist working for South Eastern Sydney uh, Local Health District. And she's the medical lead of the CASPER team, and we'll be talking about that uh, this evening, the Comprehensive Assessment Service for Psychosis and At-Risk Youth. Dr. Philippa Levy. So welcome to all our panel members. And uh, I might begin with you, John Brogdon, if I may, before I go to our second poll. John, uh, Chair of Lifeline, I know we hear that number mentioned all the time, but just to remind us the core business of Lifeline and give us a sense of uh, whether you've experienced uh, an increase in anxiety, depression, or even calls relating to feelings of, uh, you know, feelings of wanting to hurt yourself or even take your own life. Welcome to you, John. Well, welcome to you, uh, Julie. Love the background, by the way, for all of us. We're all wondering if that's your room or not. <laughs> I'm soon to be a grandmother and I'm in the baby's room. Well, congratulations. <laughs> that's very exciting news. Um, the uh, And thanks to Walpa, my friend, uh, John Tucker, who I used to work with many years ago. And uh, thanks for everything you do for your community and the community at large. And it's great to be back again after having an uh, opportunity to join you over at Bondi Junction, I think last year. Look, Lifeline's been around since 1963. It is a household name. Uh, I've been on the board for 11 years. I've been the chairman for the last eight years. And I've noticed over that period of time the the appearance of the Lifeline number at the end of a story or a, a, a media article or over the radio, whatever it might be, has gone from once or twice a week to almost once a day. So that demonstrates that I think we've become much better at talking about mental health, there's no doubt about that, but also more honest in terms of the risk of suicide and the like. Lifeline usually receives about 2,500 calls a day. <coughs> from people at high risk of suicide and in crisis. 10 to 15 of those calls every day, we'll actually keep the person on the line and through our systems, be able to contact the police and ambulance and intervene, send the cops and the ambos to where that person is. So it's real life and death on a number of occasions a day. And then of course, the, uh, the, the other objective is a lot of safety plans to make sure people get through that day, that week, and move on to core services that, that others on this, on this webinar provide. You know, where, where if you like the ambulance or the paramedics who keep you alive and push you across to the next stage of service. So usually three, two and a half thousand calls a day. Um, I know we're jumping to COVID, Julie, but let's not forget we had that enormous bushfire event. And I know we haven't, but you could, you could be, um, you, you, you could imagine that you've moved on. So we went from two and a half thousand calls a day to around 2,900 calls a day in December with the bushfires. And um, that will last for a couple of years because people uh, are still not in their homes. They might be in a caravan or a shed or a, a shipping container, but they're not back home yet and their businesses aren't back together, their jobs mightn't exist. So we're still getting between 250 and 300 calls a day on bushfires alone. Uh, at the peak of COVID, we got to about 3,200 calls a day. And the peak really was around that period of uncertainty when if you like, the, the graphs we all kept seeing kept growing. And you know, the Ruby Princess, there are hollow things. And then we looked overseas and there were thousands of deaths. And, Every time you turned on the media, and you'll appreciate this as a journo, Julie, it was all bad news, all bad news. And that was the real peak where our calls got to 3,200 a day. Interestingly, they've dropped off again. and But just in the last week, they picked up to 3,000 again. We think 
so the big change is it's gone from people being worried about getting COVID and dying from COVID for themselves, their loved ones, their friends, to a real anxiety about what happens afterwards, particularly for people who've lost their job or their livelihood or their business. Because for them, by and large, the physical stuff has been handled and we have to stay responsible and there is a concern about a second wave and all of those legitimate things. And there are still hundreds of people dying in the UK every day, for example. You know, we're a bit, bit detached from that, but it's still very real. Um, we're worried when things like JobKeeper come off, which is going to happen at some stage, all of a sudden you're pulling out the pillow from people and I think a lot of people will be hit quite hard. So we anticipate those calls will go up and it's about people's anxiety at the moment. And the other thing we found earlier and we find all the time is loneliness. When you tell people to socially isolate, for some people that's a really bad signal for their mental health, fine for their physical health, you're telling them not to interact with people. I think we got the phrase wrong in the bidding. I know Ian Hickey agrees it should have been physical distancing, it should never have been social distancing. In fact, we wanted physical distancing and social interaction at the same time. And I think we've got a lot of people who've been very lonely through this time that we've been helping at Lifeline. I'm going to uh, ask you one more question uh, before I go to the next poll. So I want to just let Jackson know we're going, we only have two audience polls, but I want to do the second one before I bring in our other two panellists. But just before I, I ask Jackson to bring it up, uh, I do obsessively watch the ABC and SBS. They do a lot of programs and documentaries on social issues. And I, Lifeline comes up all the time. Yes, yes. And I wonder how you're coping with the calls. Not only right now have you got an increase, as you say, with the bushfires and with the pandemic and the uncertainty of what happens to this new normal we're going to talk about tonight, but are you coping with the load? Well, funnily enough, um, funnily enough, Julie, um, the flip side of the coin of staying at home is our volunteers had more time. So not only have we got more calls than we've ever had before, literally in our 57 year history, if that 3,200 normalises, that's 1.1 million calls a year. That's extraordinary. Um, but our, our volunteers have had more time to help us answer those calls. We've also been able to secure a fair amount of government funding. Thank you very much to the feds and most of the states for coming in quickly to uh, allow us to put more paid staff on as well. Um, and we're ready. We still remain ready for a spike if something happens again. Uh, so, yeah, look, we've been lucky. We've got wonderful volunteers who, like all people in, you know, in Walper community, Jewish community, all communities, you know, the, the people you have volunteering in difficult times give more. They don't give less, they give more. And that's what we've benefited from. Well, I must say, I'm very glad to hear you've, you've got more funding coming through because uh, Australia hasn't done badly international, by international comparison, and I'm pleased that that aspect is being uh, looked to as well. Look, I'm going to come to our second and final audience poll, uh, and Jackson will put it up, and it's what age group do you think will be most at risk of mental health issues as the result of COVID-19? And again, I'll just be quiet. While you click, there's a, a number of age ranges there. Tonight, we're talking about all age ranges and we want to get a sense of audience thoughts on what age group do you think will be most at risk of mental health issues as the result of COVID-19? Just while people are voting, I'll indicate the age ranges we're offered are 0 to 12, 13 to 25, 26 to 40, 41 to 65, and 66 and over. And in October, I'll be on the last group. Just sharing that with you. Well, Jackson, again, I might ask you to pop up and we'll see what the first blush of thoughts was on what age group do people think will be most at risk of mental health issues. And 0 to 12, 4%, 13 to 25, 13%, 26 to 40 years is the majority of the audience at 39%. 41 to 65 years, 20% of you, 
and 66 and above 25. So the biggest group is 26 to 40 years. If I could come now to Professor Ian Hickey AM, who is the person who posed this question because he wanted to get a sense of what the audience would think. Ian, why did you think, uh, if we could come to Ian now, uh, Ian, why did you think this was an important question to ask our audience before we get into the nitty gritty of managing depression, anxiety and suicide risk right now? Julie, that is such a great question because as a community, we need to understand really who is at most risk if we're to be at most effective in the particular areas. And it's kind of interesting that I hate to ruin people's ideas, but if you went to the evidence as distinct from what people may think, the real answer to that question would be 13 to 25 years being at high risk. There are certain issues in the 26 to 44 type age group very much around suicidality and job loss in that particular group. So I could understand if people put that second or if they had put children second, which will come to for family disruption reasons, uh, etc. Now, clearly, perhaps the audience that we got to this evening is a little... Now, Julie, I wasn't going to say older because since you just declared you're in the last group, and I must confess I'm not too far away from that group, I'd like to say the cancer specialists refer to that group as middle-aged. So the rest of us that are still middle-aged, we should have added on 75 plus, et cetera. But very importantly, in the mental health world, that's not the case. And there are two issues. One's got to do with the onset of mental health problems and who is most affected by what is the real challenge here, which is recession. John just said a really critical thing. If you'd had this question six or eight weeks ago, then the health anxiety, what might happen in Australia, the ramifications in our families, the, the just total change in our lives, and the physical kind of health threat and whether our governments and our good fortune and good governance would get us through, which I must say to the credit of all those involved, good fortune and good governance has got us through. The real issue as expressed by Greg Hunt just uh, two weeks ago, the deep anxiety now is the recession. And no matter what Australia does, we are part of the worldwide recession. There are industries, and you know, the people in this audience to know well that tourism and retail and hospitality are not coming back in the same way. There are going to be people who've never lost their job in their lives who will actually lose their jobs in this recession in particular ways, highly skilled other sets of people. This is incredibly socially disruptive. A lot of talk is had about war on the virus. This is not, a, recessions are not wars. In wars, people pull together, fight an external enemy, unemployment goes to zero, suicide goes down. In recessions, the opposite. Unemployment skyrockets and suicide rates go up. And unless you know, as a community, who to support. The danger is you go, I'm okay, my family's okay, but actually those who are already okay do okay. It's those who are at the margins, those who don't have the skills, those who don't have the assets, those that need support. And in this recession, as is demonstrated in the global financial crisis and elsewhere, it's actually the 13 to 25 year old group. Those who are moving through that transition in education onto employment, they don't have the assets, they don't have an independent life. I was I'm the parent of many teenagers. They often think they do, but they don't. They're actually not got the network, the skills, the support, the flexibility. And actually when things fall apart for them, which is also the age of onset of major mental health problems, anxiety, depression, things can go really badly. And you can fix the economy, but you can't fix their lives if you haven't supported them through that critical period. So just one final comment, Julie. A lot gets said about resilience at an individual level. I like to say resilience as individuals is a rubbish concept. Resilience is a community concept. What we all need is a degree of personal autonomy, control over our lives, good health, assets. But the other thing we need for mental health and well-being is a socially cohesive community. And the great pleasure of doing this thing tonight with the Jewish community, which is well known for its cohesiveness, is to make sure it takes care of all of its peoples, and particularly those who will be most marginalised in this who already were struggling or did not have the independent assets or the capability. And I think Jewish House and Jewish Care and many organisations in the Jewish community are good at this, but the whole community needs to know if ever your community really needed you, and that's young people and children, some of the older community, it's right now. 
Ian, thank you so much. And I'm going to introduce Dr. Philippa Levy, just so our audience have met the whole panel. And Philippa, I'll just get a quick comment from you, if I may. So we'll go to some questions and I'll come back. But I just want to pick up on that point of the economic emphasis that Ian Hickey has brought to us. Uh, because as I understand it, in your work as a child and adolescent psychiatrist in uh, South East Sydney, you've already come across, across situations where young people are quitting school or studies in order to work to support their family. Could I welcome Philippa Levy uh, to talk to that, please? Thanks so much, Julie. Yeah, that was something that actually really surprised me and we saw it really early on with COVID. So we have this great program that I'm involved in at Headspace where we support young people in the Bondi Junction area. It's a pilot project and I actually just got news today that we've received a Ministry of Health grant for it to continue, which is fabulous news. Um, so it's going to ex continue and even be extended. But in the last eight months, we've had an education specialist attached to our mental health team who's been able to support young people who have either already disengaged or are at risk of disengaging from their education. And that's covered the 15 to 25 age group. So it's been school students, but also those in TAFEs, universities and colleges. And a couple of the students who had been chronic school refusers, you know, missed a couple of years of school. Finally, this education specialist helped get them get back to school actually dropped back out because their parents had lost their jobs and their siblings had lost their jobs and they were the only member in the family who could actually find work and you know we saw these students drop out of TAFE to get a job at Woolies and it, it's quite heartbreaking you know that they're feeling that pressure to support their parents. And I, I just want to make it clear Philippa you're talking now about working in the public system while you do do some private work uh, uh, right. That project, the Pilot Education Study, and, and we'll talk about Casper a little later. This is a public yeah. psychiatry that you're doing. Yes, that's right. So I'm a child and adolescent psychiatrist and I'm um, the head of, you know, medical lead of the multidisciplinary team. So we have um, psychologists, social workers, occupational therapists, clinical nurse consultants, other medical staff, and we provide care to those youth you know who have new and emerging severe mental illness and we do that through these inreach clinics into three headspace centers Bondi junction miranda and hurstville and actually the funding ian mentioned that was announced um the greg hunt's announcement from a couple of weeks ago we have actually received some extra funding into headspace which means we'll be able to do you know a lot more good work there and again just in a nutshell what's headspace so Headspace is a youth mental health service. It's national, you know, lots of centres around Australia. Um, and it's for the 12 to 25 age group. Because one of our goals tonight, or key goals, is to offer uh, parents, grandparents, teachers and, and community leaders information about resources as well mm. as practical strategies. If uh, anyone was wanting to see if a, a young person could get help from Headspace or a service like your own, do you go through a general practitioner? Yeah, look, you can go through a general practitioner, but there's actually no need to. You can call Headspace directly. We're actually a walk-in centre. We have GPs who are youth-focused, who actually work in the centres, and you, you can access all the support in, in one stop in a very youth-friendly building. Oh, fantastic. Thank you. Well, look, I'd like to welcome back Dr Alan Schell, who I'm thinking of tonight as our question moderator. And would you like to uh, put one or two questions to our panel that you've received from the audience, Alan? Yes, and in fact, they follow up from Ian Hickey's uh, 13 to 25 year old. And we were going to talk about it at the last meeting we had when we talked about younger people, but the issue around uh, the use of on screen, uh, act, what's it, on, on screen options that children take up to often escape anxiety. And in some ways, that may increase their <laughs> depression and anxiety. So I just wonder if we can sort of have a double-edged sword here. We wanted people to use, as we're doing now, Zoom and school, et cetera, using uh, the assets of the internet. But in fact, has the overuse of screens increased that um, anxiety rather than escaping from it? It's such an interesting question, Alan. I mean, first of all, I don't know if people wear this, but actually suicide rates amongst young people were higher in the late 1990s before Facebook was invented. And in fact, with social messaging, particularly taking up from about 2008, 2009 onwards, 
social connection in young people has increased. And in fact, I would posit, and I've written an op-ed about this if anyone's really interested, just imagine this crisis, just imagine the Spanish flu in 1919 without this technology. Just imagine if we'd all had to go home and sit in our homes and didn't have what we're doing right now and couldn't do what we're doing. Or if young people were not able to stay connected with their friends and others, and they were just stuck at home with their parents and other people during that particular time. So the technologies themselves, the social aspects of that can do great good. And I would suggest during the current crisis, and there's some evidence of this, that's exactly what they've allowed people to do. Education's been able to continue. People who stayed connected with schools, even though they've not been able to go there. We've had to close many of our schools in the eastern suburbs, et cetera, in recent times. You know, so that side has been an upside. Now, there are, of course, risks and downsides. <laughs> so pre-COVID and post-COVID, the regulation by families and others of total screen time, screen time interfering with sleep, screen time interfering with physical activity, um, some of the antisocial aspects of screen time do need to be moderated. Now, adults, grandparents, get in there, right? You've got to know how to turn those things off while your kids are helping you to turn them on. All right, so actually, you know, we all got to learn. We're, every day I learn a new Zoom thing, you know. Every time my son or some of my grand, Julie, grandchildren help me to turn something on, I also help them to turn it off, you know, kind of in a... So, you know, these are worlds that we need, but we also need to moderate them appropriately to fit in with the rest of our social and educational structures. And, and look, I'm going to come to Philip in a, in a moment about this as well, but... You say you've got to get in there, but can you just give us more of a sense? Is it when you're dealing with uh, teenagers, it's usually about a negotiation and trying to get some sort of guidelines we agree to. You know, can you give us more a sense of what you're encouraging people to do as, as children exactly. get I'm glad you were, Julie, your words are very important when they negotiate, okay? <laughs> the last time I tried to tell my teenagers, other people, what to do, and I've had several move back home during this period and whatever else, I think I lost control over telling them what to do at a very young age. But the negotiation, I think on the other hand, I think we see a lot of teenagers and young people, often parents, and I'd say grandparents as well, underrate the importance of what they say to be in that negotiation. There's good reasons why. There are any social aspects of the internet, the interfering with sleep patterns, not engaging in physical activity, in other sets of issues. It's fine to engage with your friends, but I don't know about other people. I've actually spent more time having family dinners in the last 10 weeks I hate to say this, than I probably did in the previous 10 years. But actually, you know, a lot of opportunities. I've had, I've had an outbreak of card playing in my house. I've had an outbreak of other things, you know. So I think, you know, there are, and I think interestingly, in the original question you asked, Julie, there were 58% of people said it had adverse effect on their life. 27% have said it had been quite good. And I think we do see, for many of us, we're doing some things, including transgenerationally. And on the mental health issue, the best thing for the uh, a cognitive development of grand children, Julie, in your own situation, and children, is interaction with their grandparents. You know, the transgenerational aspects here, there's an opportunity, not just around screen time, but about coping with uncertainty. So just on two other issues, the opportunity to share many grandparents and many in the Jewish community will have dealt with tremendous adversity before in their lives. And the importance of how we do that collectively can be shared and perhaps now understood by younger people for the first time. Look, thank you so much. Philippa Levy, I know uh, I'd like your comments on the question around uh, the role of the new technologies and screen time in the transition to the new normal, because that's what our topic is tonight, you know, strategies for managing this movement to a post-COVID new normal, but also to give us a sense of what's happening for you with telehealth. But over to you, Philippa. Oh. Look, I think the amount of time that young people were spending on screens was problematic before COVID and it's gone to, you know, an even greater concern now. Kids seem to have been rewired in this time period and it's been out of necessity to engage with their learning, to stay connected with their friends, their grandparents. You know, it's been so important um, and also to allow their parents to keep functioning and maintain their employment. So I think all parents, grandparents, any carer needs to let go of any guilt associated with this time period. It had to be done in order for everyone to function and survive and maintain prosperity. But I do feel like it's time to pull it back and it is going to be hard. Um, you know, parents will have to stay strong and be calm about it, have to be consistent and need a lot of support from everyone around them. 
I've actually taken to hiding the screens in the highest place possible, um, but that's actually quite dangerous because I've got some avid climbers I've learned. So I'm thinking about installing a safe. Um, you know, I'm, I'm tempted to throw them out completely, but I recognize how important they are. You know, they're educational, they entertain us, distract us, keep us connected, and actually they connect us with telehealth, which is something that I've had to do a lot during this um, pandemic yeah, so tell period. us about that, because that's an adaption for you that has, has had some positives. Tell us about it. Yeah. Philip, look, Philippa, had... can I just jump in and say, we should put them in the dishwasher because the kids would never find them. <laughs> Very easy. <laughs> and I'm going to come to you in a second. I had a thought of that. I'll just that's get this great. comment. <laughs> Yeah, look, um, we had to adjust very quickly, you know, with telehealth, and it has actually been the standout success of the pandemic, really. Practitioners had to adapt and learn so quickly to connect with, um, with our patients. And this was at a time when all other services were dropping out. All the non-government organisations weren't able to provide health, and, you know, people with severe mental illness were more at risk than ever. So to be able to see health adapt so quickly and all the layers of usual bureaucracy just um, be taken away so quickly was phenomenal. And, and I have definitely seen the benefit in being able to continue care. Uh, I've learned a lot about the technology, how to use it. I've met lots of pets. Um, and, and one of the beautiful things is, is actually having family members involved who were normally too busy to attend the appointment. You know, mum's got a high powered job, dad's too busy, they can't come. Suddenly they were so available. And actually I had um, young people sharing the link with multiple family members and even grandparents dialing into some of our sessions. And that's been a really wonderful thing. It's so again, not this, yeah. there's positives there. We're, we're hearing an echo there, particularly this cross-generational connection, this more availability. And it's funny, I had my first telehealth today with a dermatologist and I introduced him to both my cavoodles. So it's obviously... <laughs> <laughs> and it was probably the highlight of his day. <laughs> <laughs> but Jen Walker, can I come to you? I know the question related to young people. Uh, can you give us a sense, though, of the age range that Lifeline received calls from? And also, are you only using telephones or do you use mm. other technology? So we... The, the typical... The, look, the majority of people who call Lifeline are exactly the same group of people that that graph identified. So we get a big chunk of people around 45 to 55, you know, 40 to 55. And um, I guess I'd put that down. I'm, I'm in that age category. I'd put that down to the, you know, um, ageing parents, teenage kids, mortgage. Uh, if you live in a big capital city, big, big mortgage, job stress, not enough sleep, all of those sorts of things. Um, so that's our, our typical uh, group of, uh, sorry, our largest single, not the majority, but the largest mm. single. Uh, we deal with a lot of people who are lonely. You know, it's, it's so sad, so sad, but I'm so pleased Lifeline's there. For many people, the only the voice they hear all day or all week is Lifeline. Um, and there is great loneliness out there. And I'm sure Walpa would see that through and the Jewish community would see that. And, 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 and I know is helping to deal with it as well. And many would say there's an epidemic of loneliness. And I think the UK government has a minister for loneliness, which is an extraordinary concept. Uh, in terms of our modes of service, we've been doing phones since 1963. In the last two years, we've been moving progressively to add text services. We did a couple of trials, one of which was in Adelaide. And the most incredible pieces of feedback I want to share with you are um, the majority of people who use the text service in the trial said that they would not have contacted Lifeline if the text service were not available. In other words, they never pick up the phone. Um, so typically we're targeting younger people. And I often think back to 1963 in, in Australia when it was illegal eagle to attempt to commit suicide, go and work that out. Um, it was an incredible taboo. I'm a Catholic, you know, the Catholic Church wouldn't bury people who'd taken their own life. We lied about it, we, you know, nobody. It was, a, it, was a, it was incredible. So back then we broke the taboo and started taking telephone calls and that was a shock. Um, so at my age, I think, well, why wouldn't you talk to somebody? Why would you text somebody? But we all have children or grandchildren um, who text more than they talk almost. So for them, that's how they feel comfortable. So it is the phone. It is as radical as the phone was, you know, 50 years ago. 
And the other thing is, uh, interestingly, a much larger proportion of Indigenous Australians use text than as a proportion of the community. So Aboriginal Australians equal about 2.5% of the community. About 5 plus percent of our, our text users are Aboriginal Australians as well. So some very interesting indications that we... So what we're basically doing is effectively the same thing, but in a different format. Um, the one big... And we also do uh, online chat as well. The one big change is uh, that we've, just, we've discovered with chat and it's been, it's been verified by text, is that when people talk, they'll often come to the story. You know, we'll walk them through the story and they'll tell us, you know, and it will, be, it will start with a, I've got a financial problem and end with a, I'm suicidal, you know, as you walk them through. In fact, only 3% of people tell us they're suicidal at the beginning of a phone call, but 30% of our phone calls are about suicide. In text and in um, chat, people come right to the point. They will tell you straight up, I'm being blessed by my stepfather and I feel suicidal. So we've actually had to retrain our people because the, the literally the delivery method has changed because the way people work um, on text and the like is very direct, very blunt. Just a, a quick answer to this, if you would, John, uh, and I'll, I'll come to another question from Alan, but You've mentioned loneliness and part of what we're being asked to talk about is what is this new post-pandemic normal going to be like, I guess, particularly until or if there's a vaccine. And I'm just wondering, in your vision, in Lifeline and your own vision, is this question of dealing with loneliness um, as people are, will be hesitant to gather together closely or to touch? Mm. You know, I've you know I've I have friends, a lot of friends actually, who don't live with someone, do not have a partner, mm. and to lose touch, that's mm. a very primal thing. So, do you see that as one of the key challenges for service providers such as yourself? Um, oh, without a doubt. And um, as I said before, the minute we said social isolation, for a lot of people, that was just a, an incredible burden. It was basically saying, look, you live by yourself maybe you work or don't work or you get out and you go down the shop. And I think of my 87 year old father, dad lives in a small um, charitable retirement village. He's pretty self-sufficient, but he's got, you tick every box, diabetes, kidney, heart, everything, right? He tick, but he's a happy man. He's got a happy way of, of living. So he gets over all that sort of stuff. So when we said you can't go out of the house, he was the sort of bloke who'd go down and buy a, a, a loaf of bread just for the sake of it to talk to people. He, he couldn't do that. Um, so we taught him to use FaceTime. Uh, as many of you would know, I've experienced uh, six months, sorry, three months of talking to my father's forehead rather than his face because he doesn't know how to use his mobile phone, but, but better than nothing. So we've had to help to, to a adapt him to that as well. But if he didn't have a family like us who lived nearby and brother and sister and the like, he could have been on his own. So the, the reach out on loneliness has only become better. And here's where maybe there's a, maybe I'm, right for young people and wrong for old people. We hear great stories about old people adapting to social media and the type and, you know, knowing more about computers than I do and all that sort of stuff. But the reality is nothing, I don't think, as a human, nothing replaces physical contact. And without physical contact, hearing somebody's voice or seeing somebody's face in this fashion. So I've encouraged people, Julie, to pick up the phone and ring people they haven't spoken to in a couple of years. Mm -hmm. Ring people who they know live alone, like your friends, or they know will be out of a job in this environment. Just say good day. And that might be the only call. They might get plenty of texts, but that might be the only call they get all day. Uh, so really, people, those of us who are well, those of us who do have capacity, we can make a real difference by just, just by picking up the phone and ringing people in our world uh, and our bigger world who we know would do, would get a marvellous kick in the day from a chat with somebody um, they know. Lovely to talk to you, John. Thank you. <laughs> uh, Alan Shell, could I come back to you for another question from our audience? Yes, so as always, when you have wonderful panellists discussing things, we answer some of the questions. But the, the one big one, I think, even though John is talking about texting and having a yarn, um, what are some of the signs that a person might have or be at risk for suicide? And we've also, we've accepted that's a word, although taking one's life, I guess, is the bigger picture. And of course, going on from that, um, is there a difference between the signs of depression versus somebody who's wanting to take their own life? And that goes for all ages, unfortunately, because it's uh, both for young people and for older people. You know, uh, what I might do, Alan, before I come to members of our panel is to invite uh, 
Emma Cohen uh, from uh, Jewish Care. She's the Suicide Prevention Coordinator at Jewish Care. And to ask her what Jewish Care is currently providing in relation to mental health and suicide prevention. I'm not sure if Emma's joining us by voice or by- Yes, here I am. Oh, hi, hello. Can you tell us some, um, because part of what we want to do is let people know the services. So what is Jewish Care doing? Uh, Jewish Care is uh, coordinating the Jewish Suicide Prevention Strategy, the JSPS, which is the first and only Jewish specific strategy in Australia. Um, it was developed in 2017 uh, in response to a number of suicides and suicide attempts within the community. So even though Jewish Care coordinated, it is actually guided by the Lifespan Framework, which was developed by Black Dog Institute and their whole community approach. So we have uh, 21 organisations on our committee. Most of them are, a, um, are Jewish organisations and others are not. So some of them are psychologists at Jewish schools. Uh, we have a few rabbis. Uh, we have Jewish crisis and emerg emergency medical services, uh, people from youth groups and things like that. The concept of the whole community approach is that within each organisation, they um, the representatives can then champion the strategy and uh, speak to and encourage their own communities um, to talk about mental health and suicide prevention. One of the main things we do uh, that we have been doing for a few years now is providing free mental health first aid and suicide prevention training to communal organisations and community members. Um, and the, we've now um, trained over 400 community members and the, the aim of training these people is to educate people on mental health and suicide prevention um, in order to reduce the stigma. So we're trying to teach as many people in the community to understand what mental health is, to recognise the signs of mental health and to be able to feel confident in approaching someone um, in order to help support them and encourage them to seek professional help. Um, so we are continuing to provide this training and through COVID we've been doing this online um, and we've actually uh, in the last two months we've actually um, just completed our sixth mental health first aid and also suicide prevention training. So we haven't stopped it, we've continued and, and adapted in that way. It's obviously a shorter training and it's been adapted because it is online um, but there's certainly been a, a big uptake on that. Can I just ask you, in terms of, um, you know, the new normal, but part of our topic tonight, is the move to online training, do you think that's going to be with us for a while because it is part of the new normal that people are less willing or it's just not considered completely safe to gather people to get them? I think so, yes. I think that when we are allowed to go back to face-to-face -to -face training, we will uh, still do that, but I think there will be a combination of providing online and face-to-face. -face. I think a lot of people will still take time to become comfortable to sit in groups. Um, it, the training has been adapted for online and I think, I think going forward um, it has worked and I think going forward we will continue to offer both options. I was interviewing a nurse on another topic the other day at St Vincent's Hospital and she'd gone to eight different training sessions in the last fortnight because she was a mother of four and she was loving all the online training because she was able to actually do more and I thought that for some it is a positive, isn't it? It is. And we've actually had um, one of the communal organisations that has um, run the online training with us in the last couple of weeks um, we've been trying to encourage them to do training with us face to face for quite a while and actually um, the fact that it was online was the reason that they chose to do it at this point in time. Um, Is there anything else you would like to say? Uh, yes, I'd like to add that in addition to uh, mental health and suicide prevention, we are currently trialling and running um, an aftercare program, which is a very individualised program um, and approach to help anyone who um, has been affected by suicide and is coming out of a hospital or a clinic. And it's a, it's a strategy to support them and their families in that time. And it is a strategy that is existing to um, cover the, the spots that are not generally offered in the general community. We're extremely fortunate to have communal funding uh, from the Walpole Foundation and from JCA and some major donors. 
and this has allowed us to offer some services that are not otherwise offered and that fill the gaps in mainstream. Thank so. you so much, Emma. That was really great. Uh, if I may, I'll come to Dr. Philippa Levy now, just on this question of suicide. If you could give us a sense of the sort of warning signs that parents and grandparents should be watching out for, and then your recommendations on what people should do if they're concerned. Yeah, I think the major thing is to actually be raising awareness like we're doing and, you know, thinking about these things and just closely watching and asking questions if you've got any concerns. What you notice um, with depression and with someone who's experiencing thoughts of suicide is that they're more socially withdrawn in that depressed mood, except for children and adolescents who actually present a bit differently and they tend to be a bit more irritable and angry. So you might look at, you know, a child or adolescent and think that they're frustrated and, and snappy, but it could actually be a sign that they are depressed. Um, they experience loss of pleasure, anhedonia. They don't get the usual pleasure from activities that they do. They might have sleep changes, either sleeping too much or too little, appetite and weight changes. They could have difficulties with their concentration, be more indecisive. Actually, their movements change, so they can be more agitated or, or retarded, moving slower than usual, and, um, and having recurrent thoughts about, about dying or about suicide. So really being... Sorry? Oh, I was just going to ask you, that Greek word you used again, uh, could you just explain a little bit more about that? I, I'm a cancer survivor, and I have been monitored a few times for my mood. And, and I, was, I got the impression that issue of a loss of joy was a very important point. Could you just That's talk right. a little bit more about that? Yeah. So, you know, when people are depressed, they just lose interest in things around them. Um, everything looks a little bit dull. They don't get that usual enjoyment from things that, that, they, that they do. And you'll often hear people who've recovered from depression talk about this, where they've realised they're better when they look around and see that the colours are brighter. Thank you. So sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you. Your your advice to people who've listened to that list and are concerned about someone. What, what yeah, what's I, the next step? I think opening the conversation and actually being brave enough to ask people how they're doing, taking the time, make sure it's an appropriate setting where the person feels safe and you've got the time to actually listen to them and explore their concerns. You know, a warm, empathic approach. Um, Sometimes people feel more comfortable if you share a bit of your own experience. So if someone's a bit reluctant to talk, actually talking about your own struggles and what you're finding difficult can be quite hard to do. And, and I think if you do learn that there are concerns, helping the person to get to a pathway, pathway where they can get help. So it might be for a school student, you know, a grandparent might, might think of, of letting the parents know, but perhaps the school would be a good option that the school counsellor or psychologist could be involved. And I think, you know, GPs are really critical here. So getting, getting the person to see their GP and have a proper assessment of their mental state and then work out next steps. It might be that they need to see a counsellor, psychologist or a psychiatrist, but that needs to be considered after they've had a thorough medical examination. And then, of course, there's, there's services which you can approach directly, like Headspace, you know, a walk-in service. A grandparent could say, I think I'd like you to go to Headspace and help the young person attend and have an appointment and share all the concerns with the staff there too. Look, thank you. And I'm going to come to Ian next, and I will also come to John, because I, I think that we have put suicide risk on our list tonight of what we're talking about. So I think it's critical we, we do it well. Uh, Ian Hickey, could I come to you? What would you add to the comments that Dr. Levy has made? Go with a young person. You know, there was a great study done in the United Kingdom some years ago. You know, we say, if you're depressed, you should get help. If you're depressed, the last thing in the world you're thinking about is getting help. Actually, you need somebody to help you. So this series of relationships that we have, when you're in trouble, you're the last person in the world is likely to help yourself. You need somebody else. I need to know that you would look after me if I was in trouble and I would look after you if you were in trouble. So that issue of going with someone to care. I mean, as you know, well, Julie, never go to a hospital on your own for anything. Make sure you take someone there who can say to the doctors, hey, no, I'm, she's too sick. Listen to me. Get what I need. This is what she needs. This is how she is. This is what she's normally like. 
okay? This is not what she's normally like. This has changed. So one of the most important things in mental health is to try and make sure that we actually look out for each other and would take the journey to care together. And again, I'd go back to the role of parents and grandparents and others. You don't have to know the answer. Just go with a young person. Go online, go to Headspace, go to the GP, go with them and say, because young people got no idea. The health, Australian healthcare system is a bit complicated. Okay, you know, actually go with them and say, look, this is not what they're normally like. They're withdrawn, they're doing things, their stuff will go together. And you know, you don't always, the mental health care system, I'm afraid to say, Julie, is not quite as functional as the cancer care system and not always as empathic and you don't always get the right care first time and it's complicated. There's no easy blood test, there's no easy brain scan. Sometimes you've got to stick with it. And you need somebody who knows, look, healthcare doesn't always go perfectly the first time. If it doesn't go well, we'll go together. If it didn't work out, we'll find somebody else. We'll stick at it until you get the help and support. So a really difficult issue, I think, for parents, grandparents, others. And if you're an aunt, an uncle, I'll just say quietly because no one's listening. I have much better relationships with my friend's children than my own children. Right? Actually, I'm the well-known auntie to several other kids. Out, and, you know, sometimes the best person other people are not directly the parents or grandparents. They're the wider social networks to accompany and support until we sort the problem out in particular ways. And that John made this point earlier on that staying safe today so that we can solve the problem tomorrow is so important in the suicide prevention world. You know, and, and I think it's a wider community issue. It's not just the family and certainly not the kid on their own or the teenager or young adult who's got no idea how complicated healthcare is and getting good health care and mental health care is not as straightforward often as it is in other areas. So w would you go so far as to say that in terms of a broad bit of advice for the mental well-being of children and young people is that you build into your family system or if you're, you're in a faith group, your faith group system, encouraging positive relationships with other adults as yes. well as yourself. Yes, and my children are very lucky. Talk about Catholic families, John. Oh, my God, my kids have got aunts and uncles and people all over the place. And they're all in agreement. They're all much better parents than me. But my daughters know who much better aunts are and other people are. Yes, those pre-existing relationships for the kids in trouble, young people in trouble, and for ourselves. You know, at times, it isn't necessarily our partner or somebody else. It's somebody else who knows well what you're like. I mean, you know, there's a lot of things that men should talk more. Well, maybe. Some other men just understand that he's not doing what he's doing and they're there for them in ways, the being with someone who understands what you're like and can accompany you in the journey into healthcare, which is complex, is part of things. So I think that, Julie, you've hit on a really critical thing. It's the pre-existing relationships and the knowledge that that social network, the social fabric is there and wrapped around you. I mean, John's own experience and many others, and I, uh, people might want to read Malcolm Turnbull's book recently, all of us are vulnerable. All of us are vulnerable. We don't know the circumstances, which for us might be, it might be getting cancer, it might be losing your job, it might be something else happening that puts you at risk. And you don't know that till it happens to you, but by God, you need the people around you when it does happen to you. Exactly. You, know, uh, for you, you for me. Uh, thank you so much. And I'll come to John uh, uh, Brogdon now. And John, I know you've been very public about your own feelings of, uh, you know, feelings of suicide and so on. What would be your, um, I guess, particularly the recommendation on how you can help others or indeed how you can help yourself? Because mm. there'll be people watching tonight who are, you're, you're a businessman, you're aware of the business world as well. There'll be people who's, who are in bad economic trouble. They have got Sydney mortgages. They, they might have kids in private schools or faith schools and the the fees are, you know, we could go on, but that financial side of the new normal, all the predictions are, are things are going to be tough for a while, aren't they, than in the new normal? Well, they are. I think the only thing we, we don't know everything about what happens post COVID other than it will be in recession. That's probably the one thing we can fairly uh, make an assumption on in a technical recession. The, um, the hard-nosed economists often say it's good to have a recession, you know, the recession we had to have because it sort of cleans the pipes. But never forget that that also means people lose their jobs and homes and um, relationships and all of that. The, um, the, uh, 
challenge here for particularly for that age group we spoke about for, before who will be men and women in their 40s and into their 50s many of whom will be the sons and daughters of some of the older WALPA supporters on this webinar or in that age group themselves is sadly statistically particularly men over 50 really struggle to get a job once they've lost one it's a real struggle um, and that that leads to a whole lot of its own um, uh, mental health concerns as well. So I, I have depression and, and I have suicidality, outside, uh, suicidal ideation. Um, I've mm -hmm. had... That language, what does that suicidal mean? ideation. Well, let me, we've got experts on the line, but for what it means for me is for as long as I can remember, right back to my childhood, um, which was uh, a difficult childhood at times, you know, domestic violence, alcohol abuse, things like that. For me, I always had in my mind that if things went wrong, if things, if there was a catastrophe, that I would take my own life as the as the solution to that. Um, and even as a as a young teenager, I, I had those thoughts, and they only amplified as time went on. And I live with that every day, in the sense that if something goes wrong for me, if I have a really bad day at work or something might go wrong, and although these things often come out of the blue, unhelpfully, so you're not prepared for them. Um, I can catastrophize very quickly and then all of a sudden be thinking thinking about suicide. Now, I'm well medicated. I have a psychiatrist I see uh, fortnightly. I have a wonderful wife and family and friends. But all of that doesn't mean that I still don't have bad days. We all have bad days. I guess my bad days are riskier than another person's bad days. So I've had to learn to be much more self-aware, to learn how to deal with those situations. And, and I do it best by sort of just walking out of them, sort of walking out of the room, if you like, mentally, not necessarily physically, and also trying to calibrate it all uh, as quickly as possible. And for me, it's like um, I have this sort of visual image of what are the things that are bothering me, and I try and pull them down and deal with them and then expose the big thing that is troubling me and work out how I can fix that. Or maybe I can't fix it and come to terms with the fact that I've got to roll with the punches on that one. So... Uh, and what you just described then, is that something you worked out yourself or something uh, you worked with a clinician on to have a way of thinking yourself clear? Yeah, well, I, I, uh, I worked it out through my political life mostly. You know, you'd be stressed and you think, oh, what, you know, particularly in politics, you've got 100 things at once. No, no, that's not the issue. That can be fixed this way. No, no, that's okay. That's sorted out. And it's like you sort of have files, if you like. So I learned that as a way of managing the hundreds of issues that come at you every day in politics and the more senior you get, the more complex that is in the 24 hour media cycle. So things move very quickly. It's your bloody, you bloody journalists don't help by the way. But um, uh, you know, there's all of that pressure that comes on. I'm only joking. Yeah. And um, uh, I did transfer that across and, and I, I realized through doing that to my personal um, situation as well and talking that through with clinicians that that actually is a good way to handle things. But the real challenge is, is once you've worked out what that thing is, is how to deal with it then. Because you could get down to the last thing and still catastrophize over it and still be very suicidal about that's that thing I can't fix. And, um, you know, we, we at Lifeline say, and I, I know Ian and others agree, most suicides are preventable. Um, if people get the right support at the right time that they need and then continue with that support for some period of their life. And that's what makes the, the 3,200 deaths by suicide in Australia every year so traumatic. Um, so in terms of dealing with it, really, uh, one of the things we've discovered, well, what have we discovered, those, those in this sector have discovered is we used to sort of have the, uh, what's wrong, come on, get off the lounge, you know, what are you whinging about? Um, you know, what's wrong with you? you? You know, get a move on or let's go down to the pub and have a drink or come on, let's go to the movies or whatever it might be. That, what, what we really need to do when we're worried about people is ask that very direct question, um, particularly if we're really worried, which is, are you feeling suicidal? Do you think you want to hurt yourself or kill yourself? Now, most of us stop, our heart stops beating and we say, I could never say that. That's the most, that's, how could I possibly say that to anybody? And wouldn't I be putting that thought in their mind? Yeah. All of the research and all of our anecdotal evidence shows that almost like a poison, you bring it out of them. And it, most people, thank God, will say, no, no, but listen, I've got a problem here or, you know, I've got a problem with my relationship. They'll, they'll tell you um, or there won't be anything wrong. They're having a bad day. If they do tell you, you th this is where people often panic and say, well, I'm not a professor. Uh, what do I do? How can I help? Well, 
um, you wouldn't walk past somebody in the street who had a heart attack because just you wouldn't. So you wouldn't walk past somebody who's suicidal. So hang on to them and ring triple O, we'll get them to a doctor or whatever it might be. Don't leave them alone. But it's a case of bringing it out of people and them, strangely enough, as I said, as, as bizarre as that concept is to many people, that's the way you cut through all of the, you know, you'll be all right, don't worry, mate, let's go and have a beer, all of that stuff you just cut through with a very open, honest and confronting question. If the answer is yes, you don't have to be an expert, hang on to them, ring triple O, get them to a doctor, <clears throat> treat them in the same way you'd treat somebody who had a physical, um, who has a physical illness at that time, like a heart attack. That is a Thank you so much, John. And I just want to come, uh, to, before we uh, come to another question, to Dr. Levy again, if I may. Would you add uh, any comments there on what John said or any other, you know, three key messages to take away in terms of you do ask someone and they say yes? Yeah, first, I just want to thank John for your honesty in that discussion. It's just um, so moving to hear you talk about it and just to be raising that awareness from your personal experience is, is so, so important for our whole community. I think, um, you know, there's, there's lots of evidence that actually people do approach staff and particularly their GPs prior to a suicide attempt. So actually within the 24 hours before attempting suicide, someone would have likely reached out to their GP and tried to get help. So that's a really key window. And it, it does give people confidence that you should actually be inquiring because that's where people are ambivalent. They haven't perhaps decided that that's what they want to do. They're, they're looking for ways um, out of their situation and you've got a prime opportunity to be offering support and keeping them safe. And I, I agree with, you know, the comments about not being afraid at any level. You don't have to be a doctor to be asking the question. You know, the person closest to, to um, the suicidal person should be actually inquiring and, and making sure that they get the right care. I don't know that I've ever heard anyone say they ring triple O. Uh, to be honest, uh, you, you know, just because I MC things and I have MC things on suicide prevention before and I... I just think that I found that a very powerful comment that you wouldn't walk yeah. past someone having a heart attack just because you're not a cardiologist. You know, you would you would hold their hand and ring triple O. Is that, is that a very good practical bit of advice? If Absolutely. I mean, people who are acutely suicidal can do impulsive, risky things. Mm. So you wouldn't want to leave anyone, you know, by themselves in that stage because they could run off and do something very drastic, like jump in front of traffic or head to the gap. You know, so um, absolutely that should be the advice. Yes. Yeah, so suicide can happen like that. You know, you can have a very happy life, everything's going okay, then out of the blue, something goes wrong, like a COVID thing, like a, I've lost my business, my marriage has fallen to pieces, or, you know, things that, that are happen, and have, happening at an accelerated rate through the last three months, and, and the next, I guess, three or more months. And it's at that point that they do or don't ring Lifeline, that they do or don't reach out, they do or don't pause on the cliff, where you can literally, you can literally pull people back from that by intervening, and, and that happens every day every day uh, or they you know the you know um you, you can you can intervene in those last precious few moments and and pull pump somebody's back and save their life it really can happen and if i could just say and, and alan i'm going to go to someone else from jewish care before i come to you for, for a, a final question or two but i just want to say as someone who had a my late mum had many both physical and mental health issues and I have often run triple O and I have always been met with the greatest warmth, care and professionalism and I've never been told why did you ring triple O. They, they really are tops. Is that a fair comment, Philip? <laughs> they, they're just a top mob. They really are. And they've had a lot of mental health training and now there are actually mental health nurses who are going to be attached to services and you know emergency response teams and actually attend the scene and help provide crisis support which may actually prevent someone from attending an emergency department or you know accessing care in other ways so it's definitely the thing to do we often encourage the use of safety plans in people who have severe illness and incorporated in that is what to do when you're feeling unsafe and it might be calling lifeline you know calling um calling the Beyond Blue, Suicide Callback Services, all the helplines that are really effective 
and, and emergency services is definitely on there. Either call emergency services or attend the nearest emergency department. Look, thank you. And I, I just want to welcome now uh, Claire Gilmunoz, and I hope I'm pronouncing your name correctly, uh, General Manager Mental Health and Wellbeing at Jewish Care. Mm -hmm. Because I, I'm, I'm interested, uh, when we spoke to Emma Cohen earlier, she talked about some of the changes in the way Jewish Care were delivering uh, training through webinars and so on. And I, I was interested mm -hmm. in what else Jewish Care is doing differently as you grapple with the uh, new normal. Is Claire there? Yes. Hi, Julie. And first of all, I agree with, with everything that the presenters have spoken about this evening. And I, you know, I feel incredibly proud to be the manager of the mental health services at Jewish Care. We continue to complement all mainstream services. And the thing that's been noticeable over the last two or three months is that people have reconnected with community, which has been wonderful to see. And I think that we, we kind of base that on the number of different mental health training that we've been providing over the last three years, which has been uh, I've lost volume on, on clear. Can everybody... Could no, so have I, so have I. Can you hear me now? Oh, You're we've back. got your voice back now, thank you. Oh, very good, very good. That a lot of people that have attended the training in the last three years have felt more confident about talking about the different different mental illnesses, about understanding suicide prevention. And with that, people have come back to Jewish care to, to, to ask, you know, is there something more that we can be doing? We've been able to advise about um, all the different mainstream services, but also be able to capture if there are gaps in services. And that's where Jewish care really, really comes into its own, whether it be through flexible community funds, whether it be through our um, youth services where we have five qualified youth social workers, whether it be with our links with, with Headspace, whether it be through um, the work that we do with the Black Dog Institute, with the Jewish Suicide Prevention Strategy, but really being creative um, with how we help individuals. Um, the other wonderful thing about Jewish care is that I, you know, I always make reference that we provide services from cradle to grave, and we really are a one-stop shop. Whereas, you know, our, our building in the centre of Bondi Junction provides disability, aged care, mental health and family support services, which is, which is unusual. You know, we're providing a whole of community approach um, and moving more towards a whole of health approach, I think, post COVID. And have you changed the way you're working with the community over this COVID pandemic period in any way? Yeah, we've had to. <laughs> like all organisations, we, you know, one of the main core services that we provide, we provide an NDIS service and we also support other people with severe and enduring mental illness. And we've had to equip people in all sorts of telehealth because that's an essential service where they've needed assistance to, to stay connected. Um, we've also been quite creative with how to engage with people who are socially avoidant. For people that are socially avoidant, they've certainly not been proactive. So we, we've really gone gung-ho with telephoning and making contact with everybody that's been known to any one of the divisions um, to alleviate some of the isolation that, that people have been, have been feeling. Look, thank you so much, Claire. I think we've got time for one more question. I'll uh, come to my question moderator, Dr. Alan Schell, and let's just do one more question, Alan, before we uh, uh, come to a conclusion. Okay, two things. I'll make a comment first. There have been a, a couple of very good questions around older people surviving this sort of pandemic, and I would like to say that we will be having our next seminar on the 1st of July, which will be the topic of supporting older people in this time of crisis. So for those couple of older people like myself, um, we've got to hang out for another couple of weeks, and I apologise for that. Uh, the other one that has come up a couple of times is and, and certainly Philippa talked about it, when children get more involved using Xbox and screen time, um, is that a way of coping with their uh, rejected um, and loss of uh, enjoyment? Or is that something we have to teach kids to wean off in order to find out what the problems are? And if we're gonna wean them off, how are we going to do it? So perhaps Ian and Philippa could sort of look at that. One has an increased, um, the increased use of Xbox or screen time and games, is that part of that switching off 
and withdrawing or is it something that we should be really looking at? Let's get them off there to see what the problems are if there are any. Thank you, Ian. Do you want to go first? Yeah, I don't think it's necessarily problematic. I mean, one of the things to say is a lot of the games that young people play are actually played with other people on their games. So a lot of the games, you know, whether you know it or not, there's a lot of other people playing the same game. So actually, particularly for teenagers, they're actually connecting with other people, young people themselves. So I don't think it by itself is indicative of a mental health problem, <laughs> no. But a large amount of time spent at it. <laughs> so... You know, you've got to be as interesting or perhaps more interesting than their friends they're playing the machine with. Now, this is a little bit challenging, okay? You're going to have to dream up some stuff <laughs> that actually represents it. Now, games and gaming is really smart. Gaming like poker machines is set up to be extremely engaging. It's visually engaging. Hundreds of millions of dollars are spent by companies that make games to make them sociable and engaging. Okay, so if you want to get the kids off, you're going to have to spend a bit of time and money and effort and be a bit creative. What's it going to be that you're going to provide a substitute? And I'd suggest it needs to be social and it needs to be engaging in particular ways. Now, again, I think grandparents and other people and aunts and uncles are going to think smart stuff. Sociable stuff is engaging, particularly to teenagers. Okay, so particular kinds of, and I think there are opportunities. Many families have spent more time together. They're doing other particular things and returning to things that families did. I've had some great examples of people playing instruments together, singing together, playing cards together, doing all sorts of things that actually a lot of teenagers have never had a lot of experience of. We're all very busy. People are working a lot. You know, and they go, actually, that's not as boring as I thought it was. Actually, it's highly enjoyable. You know, but it takes a bit of time and effort and planning. And maybe I think at John's point, people have had a bit more time at home on their hands <laughs> to use was. And learning skills, I've got to say, learning skills from older people. You know, if you're an older person who does one of those things and you've never had the opportunity to do it with your grandchildren or your teenagers, do it now. You know, show them stuff you know that preceded gaming. It was quite interesting. And, and, and I was going to just say two quick comments and you comment. One is, I was always told as a parent, it's what you do, not what you say. And a lot of us... Older people spend a huge amount of time on our phones. I mean, they, they were designed for us to get overwhelmed by, and there's a lot to do on them. Um, and I know plenty of people over 30 who never are anywhere without their iPhone or whatever in their hands. And then the other thing, is it ever the right thing to do is to get in there and play with them? Yeah, so I just to pick up your point, I think a really important one, Julian, and I just say this particularly about young men. You know, people are always being told to speak more, tell more, say more. Actually, I'd say if you want to have a conversation with someone, Start by doing something with them. And while you're doing, <laughs> guess what? People have conversations while they're doing. So rather than you must talk to me, you must put that thing down, you must speak to me now, forget it. Go do something with young people, with other people. It's part of, as we normally do. And in the context of doing that, and you see men working on a car together or putting a bike together or banging something together or people in the kitchen, my kids like to cook, considerably better at it than me. While doing those things, people then talk then they converse, they do it in a more normal kind of way. So the activity bit of the things, but you are in competition with stuff that's been pretty much designed to grab their attention and that of their friends to be socializing with. So gonna to have to be smart about this bit of inventiveness. Look, thank you. And Philip, are your comments? Uh, I would add that um, to the activity of how to engage with young people in the doing with them, exercise is a great way to do that, you know, and parents going to exercise with, with their kids is a really helpful way to actually have those difficult conversations. We don't necessarily need to have eye contact, but you're there with them and they, they can really benefit from that support. I, I do think um, the, the gaming is, is a great way to get involved and we've certainly seen cases where young people are speaking to other family members from other rooms of the house and actually engaging with them. And even as a mental health team, we have had to do this before. Um, we looked after a boy who had not really left his room from playing games for a number of years. And in the end, our team joined the game and connected with him that way in order to offer a mental health service, which was just a creative way of actually getting on the same page as him. Look, thank you. And I want to let our audience know we will be finishing up within 10 minutes. I just want to ask Philippa one more thing before I come back to Alan Shell to close our, our meeting tonight, which I, I personally have thoroughly enjoyed. But this is shocking in a way because what I'm going to ask you about, I'm sure, is a very big thing. But CASPA, the Comprehensive Assessment Service for Psychosis and At-Risk Youth, can you just 
give us a little bit of information about that and how it's relevant to tonight? Because it sounds like you're dealing with that more serious hard end of mental health challenges as well. That's right. We deal with the more moderate to severe end of illness. And our team has the unique ability of being able to do assertive outreach. So we are actually able to reach people in their homes if they're not willing to access health directly themselves, which is a great capability. Um, really, there's, there's a lot of kids who fall through the gap and actually transitioning from child and adolescent service into adulthood is a really at risk period. So actually by covering the range up to 25, we're able to provide care to a lot of young people in those difficult transition years. We cover a whole broad range of illnesses and that's because things are quite undefined in that time. You know, as illness is emerging in those years, it's, it's not necessarily clear what's happening diagnostically. So I would say that we are just looking after pretty much any end of severe illness and that's psychosis, obsessive compulsive disorder, mood disorders, anxiety disorders, a whole, a whole range of things. And just explain assertive outreach again, you know, sure. what that really means. Does that mean you can go in through a door with a police officer if needed? I mean, just what does it mean legally and, and, and in terms of someone who's really unwell and refusing service? Yeah, I'm, I'm so glad you asked that. You know, our preference is obviously to engage with people who are willing to have a service, but there are occasions where people are too unwell to actually do that. Um, so if, if a family's really struggling and they can't get their child to attend our service, we will actually visit them in the home and we will try to engage them and, and build up that rapport and therapeutic relationship. But if there are any acute risk concerns and we think that person will need to be in hospital for a period of observation and care, we are able to organise that in an involuntary way. We've rarely had to do that over the last few years, but, but of course we are able to when the circumstance arises. And that can be life-saving, bottom line. Absolutely, yeah. I just want to make a comment, Julie, about you know working in Bondi Headspace and having access to Jewish care because they're one of the consortium partners and it's been a privilege to work with them. And a big question on the ground during our any clinical review meeting when a young person comes up and we can't think of enough service because, of course, we've got um, limitations with resources, people ask, oh, are they Jewish? And if they're not Jewish, just the disappointment, you know, because we know that if someone has a Jewish background, we can refer them on to Jewish care and the, the range of services available just really opens up. Well, look, I, yeah. if I do require... Um, uh, aged care. I'm absolutely committed <laughs> to conversion to get into Montefiore at Randwick. I just want to put that on the line. But I, I, I would like to thank our panel, but I will hand back to Dr. Alan Schell. And uh, Alan, you might clarify too that in relation to Walper Jewish Hospital, you do take non-Jewish clients, don't you? But uh, I'll hand back to you, so thank you. Okay, before we do our thank yous, Walper Hospital has always been supported by the Jewish community, but has had all faiths um, including a number of highly respected Catholic gentlemen out there. And uh, I can only say that we, we really are part of the community and um, we love being part of it and supporting it as with Jewish care. And, and of course, all the work that John Brogdon and, and everybody else does at Lifeline and Beyond Blue are, are beyond words, really, aren't they? I mean, it's... Uh, and people... And, and I've had some comments here quietly that people have learnt a lot from tonight. Uh, what I have to say is um, we'll, we'll say our thank yous and I'll give you a couple of uh, other points after that. I want to say a big thank you to all our speakers, to Philippa, to John and to Ian, and thank you very much for all your wise words and very inf informative to our dear Julie for conducting herself as always, presiding over these evenings. And I think for all the... And we had well over 100 participants logged in, which means we know we've probably got about 130 to 150 people listening, which is great. Uh, that we will provide you with a return survey, which we'd like to answer, and as much information as we can about the people we talked about today and other community support services that are out there for all of us. Um, our next seminar, which will be on the 1st of July, again, uh, supported by our wonderful Julie, uh, will be on supporting older people in the time of crisis. We're partnering with COA, Centre of the Age, and our speakers then will be Professor Henry Badati, Melissa Levy, and Professor Richard Bryant. Um, and as always, in running these events, we, we would ask you, you know, if you're not a bona fide friend of WALPA, we'd like to become one because we'd like you to be up to date with our future events, uh, which some of them are Q&A, some of them are just simply a, a very informative evening. 
and we do have newsletters and invitations, but we do not uh, send any of this, your information anywhere else except for our use uh, through this sort of venue. So I'd like to say a big thank you, as they say in the world of uh, the deaf, you got to thank you, thank you. And to say, uh, wish you all very well, stay safe. And as always, we'd like to see you again on the 1st of July. And thank you very much. Thank Good you. Night. Thank you. <laughs>